of, you know, books with thoughts and words, not, not the picture books that I get. <laughs> Charles is looking festive too. I think I think he's going I think Charles is going through a uh a Martha Stewart phase. He's my spiritual animal. So we're um, gonna have SEO Fight Club canapé here a little bit. <laughs> indeed. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of SEO Fight Club. I'm saying hello in the YouTube chat and reminding people to ask questions. Um, today is a Q and A uh, episode, so uh, hopefully people uh, are, are going to bring some questions. But you know, we'll start off by uh, talking uh, about some recent topics. But well, I guess uh, most importantly, we should mention the Black Friday special. I mean, it'd be kind of crazy to forget that. So uh, we'd like to thank our uh, testing sponsor, who is uh, fueling us with press releases so we can test them in SEO so that we can provide better information to you. So this is a uh, no money changing hands sponsorship. He is giving us access to his platform so that we can run SEO testing and we can report to the whole community community uh, about how press releases are working. So uh, that's what this sponsorship is. And so if you like this kind of activity in SEO, uh, give his service uh, a try, you know, and he's giving you one heck of a discount. So 25% off for uh, now until Black Friday. And uh, be sure to think about your needs for the whole year because he never discounts this deeply again for the rest of the year. And the credits last a whole year, so they will last you until next Black Friday. And so, you know, think about what you're going to need four months from now because now would be a great time to save some money on that future need. So I highly recommend buying your press release credits when their price is at an all-time low. And so uh, now's your window of opportunity. Uh, Madge, uh, anything else you want to add about your Black Friday special? Yeah, thank you, Ted. Um, this is the biggest ever sale that I've done. Um, it's never been 25% before, but this time, year, well, this time around I decided, okay, you know what? Let's do it. Um, so far, the response has been really good because people normally top up their credits this time of the year. And mm -hmm. 12 months minimum that the sorry, ma maximum the credits will uh, be live and kicking for. But if you do have two or three, I'm very lenient. If you've got two or three or four credits remaining in your account and you haven't used them, I'll be nice to you and you can keep them in there. I've done that for many people in the past. Um, but yeah, take advantage of the gold because that is that's the cheapest price it's ever been, and it's got the best uh, distribution of all from MSN and Business Insider and Globe News. Well, so it's got yeah. a nice mixture. Yeah, and, Terry, and just... the, the ahead, pricing I have up there right now that's the regular pricing, so it's twenty five percent off that pricing you see there. I should have okay. modified the graphics. So just know that the prices shown are the full price. After you apply the code, you get 25% off. Um, so Terry just popped in uh, chat. You know, the, the Black Friday deals are a good tax write-off, you know, for uh, getting those expenses in this year, uh, even though you probably won't use the credits until, you know, January. Um, so that's that's actually a nice little tip there. A um, couple of questions for you, Madge. One, the hacker in me wants to know if I tried the code BF95. Any any chance that works remarkably well? Um, I'm guessing you've already tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. Uh, the other one uh, is, have you thought about doing a uh, sort of a, a course or training best uses uh, of press releases? Because there are not a lot of those out there. Uh, it's funny you say that. 
that's something coming in 2024. Um, because I've realized, Lee, a lot of not just SEOs, but even business people, they don't mm -hmm. really understand the concept of PR. Um, some do, some unfortunately don't. And it's not me telling you what's right or wrong. But what I've tested in the last eight to 10 years of doing PR, with the combination of SEO, I now know what does work. And yes, there is something hopefully coming out in the next, well, next year, hopefully, m maybe February, March time, when I do bring out a course that will, similar to what I did for Google News, mm. either do a live course for, for individuals that want to join and show them how, step by step of how to use a PR service, right? Uh, and leverage, depending on what type of client you have, whether it's for local, national, uh, whether you're targeting the GMB, whether you're targeting organic or a combination of both, um, right. help them in the right way and see what it takes us. But yes, I am. That is something I am considering. Very cool. Cause it's, a, it's definitely a need in the marketplace. Cause everybody, you know, you see the questions all the time, you know, do press releases work? And then, you know, I tried to press release and it, it didn't work. And most of the time when I see people who've said, I tried, you know, uh, that and it didn't work. If you tried one of the better service providers, like, you know, magic PR and stuff like that, it's, you know, because you targeted something incorrectly, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not the press release. It's the, uh, um, recipient yeah, but i think what i honestly believe is a lot of people are just more bothered about the links when it comes to pi it shouldn't just be the link that you should be focusing on yeah it's the brand exposure and it's the authority that you're receiving from these publications right and over time because these are permanent links and if you're stacking the prs on top of each other you know yourself you do it you know with press and rent whoever you use yep. you see for yourself what it can do but when you optimize the pr alongside syndication it just makes it a lot more powerful oh yeah i think a, a lot of seos uh because of the knowledge gap in the area of public relations uh, mm -hmm. a lot of seos have been reduced to making it a number and mm -hmm. so i i know i'm very guilty of that that's my primary use case uh for it too because uh, obviously the the things that seos are announcing often aren't newsworthy as as eric was mentioning mm -hmm. and so really it it came down to you know referring domains and that's that's one practical use case and it's a very powerful one and it does work uh, but it isn't necessarily the best way to use press releases. And so I really like this idea that you take your your knowledge of what you've seen for years from hundreds of different organizations running press releases, which ones killed it, which ones didn't, and why. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's an amazing resource. And so, yeah, I think everybody wants that. And I'm hoping that when you make your course, you'll make a little tiny mini edition to be a Fight Club episode. And then we can say for a deeper dive on this topic, go check out the course. So I'll put that out there. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> when you make the course, let's do maybe a highlights episode. Yeah, and the, the other thing which is really uh, nice is, you know, and Madge has been on and talked about press releases a number of times, you know, here and elsewhere. He's not one of those people that's always saying, oh, you need gold every time. Just gold, gold, gold. He's not, it's, you know, he will tell you when you need a bronze, when you need a silver, when you need a gold, depending on, you know, the the type of results you're looking for in the situation that you're in. So, you know, you're not looking at somebody that's just saying, hey, that, that's the package. That's the one that works. If you want everything to work, buy gold. <laughs> mm. No, so. because every client is different, right? Mm. Every SEO, depending on your budget, depending what your end goal is someone someone may just want the bronze just for a deliverable just to send that client a report to say here you go this is what we've done this month right but some do want to show that extra level of moving the needle and showing those premium publications to a client to say here's the value factor of doing a pr campaign right yeah and when they see their name pop up in different publications but also those publications showing up on page one mm. it excites a client a lot more 
So yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter which package you buy, as long as you try it out, trust me, you'll be coming back for more. Because yeah. it's the things that we do in the back end after a PR has been done. Um, that makes it a lot more powerful. And and I highly recommend that people are that are interested in, in doing press releases that you find a way to get the data you need. So you probably have a ton of different SEO tools out there. Most of them are probably telling you about your referring domains. And if you're short like 200 referring domains, sure, one press release might move the needle. If you're short 45,000 referring domains, then 10 press releases probably isn't going to do the trick. And so you might have to think about getting data on your situation because from keyword to keyword and competitor to competitor, uh, those numbers can vary. And so a lot of people, the big complaint about press releases is I did one and it didn't do anything. And there's multiple reasons why that can happen. And Mm. so one of the reasons is you didn't get any data beforehand to see how much you would need to actually move the needle. Another issue is you weren't on topic for your keyword. You didn't point it at the right page. Uh, Sometimes you don't allow enough time for the links to be discovered. There's just a lot of reasons why you can get the, I did a press release and it didn't move the needle. And so I think that, uh, yeah, this coming idea of the course is a great idea to touch on all of those topics so that you know. It's it's something that I wanted to do for a long time. It is something, it's something that I, I wanted to do for a long time, do a course, um, because I've seen that people do need that helping hand of, because recently there's not been a PR course for a while. Um, I can't even remember the, the person who last did it. Um, but a lot has changed, Ted and Lee, in mm-hmm. the last yeah. two, three years. The editorial teams are getting a lot more strict. They know the SEO game. They know what people are trying to leverage with doing a PR. So we yeah. just have to think outside the box of, how can we leverage it, but be a, lot, be a bit more smarter about it at the same time? Yeah, and on, honestly, uh, anyone that's uh, taken training with me in the past year knows that I've been telling people to opt out of all the SEO add-ons. Like if you can, if you can have a plain uh, press release with one link and no embeds and you know no crazy over-the-top SEO. Uh, that that's been working great for me. So anecdotally, not scientifically, I've been killing it with the boring style press releases. Uh, The other thing that is working really well right now, uh, which a lot of people don't do, when they want to target a specific keyword, I'd highly recommend you do brand plus keyword. That way you are killing two birds with one stone, right? Whether it's an inner page, but mainly for an inner page, if you're targeting an inner page and it's an exact match keyword, just mix it up with the brand name in front plus the keyword. You're then targeting it as a partial and it makes a lot more sense that way because you don't want to over-optimize that keyword when sending 900 links to one inner page and to a you know a primary keyword. That's not the way to do it. Yeah, and that uh, that advice is setting you up uh, for the future. Like if, if your website is a one page website and your business revolves around one keyword, then okay, it's one and done. You do one, you can do exact match, whatever, you're fine. But that's it. That's, that's the scope of your universe to get away with that. Uh, Match is right. The second you start getting into lots of press releases over time, uh, you you want to vary the anchor text. You want to include brand mentions, and these are all safe best practices. Because that's the other thing that people don't talk about is what ends up being regrettable down the road. So we're all eager to start and get the press release out there, but what mistakes do you end up regretting that you can't undo because <laughs> you you rushed into a situation without getting the right advice? So yeah, that was a little, 
That was a little nugget drop by uh, by Matt, and I'm wondering, Ted, how come we don't have a soundboard like Dre does on his show, where we can just have the explosions, right? <laughs> hey, hey, Christmas is coming up, Lee. You need some <laughs> gift ideas. <laughs> we'll have to. We'll have no, to that's a great idea. I love it. That would be fun. Budget committee meeting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, uh, let's move on before we bore everyone to death on our sponsors so i want to remind everybody they're still available for a while longer uh check out the recordings from seo rock stars they're available i've heard lots of good feedback from people who attended live as well as got the recordings uh so be sure to check that out and uh it's a great event and there's amazing info at this conference um, and then uh, coming up in the new year, all right, SEO spring training, even though this isn't until next year, they have Black Friday pricing out now for the conference. So if you want a good deal on one of the most popular conferences of the year, uh, now's the time to check that out while you can get the good pricing and the hotels and the airfares are cheap. If you wait till last minute, all of those things go through the roof. So you got to plan ahead to keep the costs low. Yeah, it's uh, not a small I, discount. It's $500 off. So if you, you know, if you're looking at it, uh, that that's a, a significant discount. So. Yeah. So be sure and, uh, uh, you know, go check it out. Look at the speaker lineup. It's going to be an amazing event. All right. So now. Uh, we can actually talk some SEO. So, uh, Lee, uh, what's new in your corner of the world? What's the thing you're working on and looking into that you wouldn't want the public to necessarily know? Ooh, that's a, you know, there's, there's one that I'm working on that the, is, is an interesting one that the public is going to find out about, which is, you know, I, sh I shared with you a little bit, um, about three, four months ago, we we're sitting in our fight club episode and you were answering a particular question and you'd made the statement that you wanted to have the uh, most efficient, uh, SEO. And it's not a statement that you hadn't made before, you know, and we've talked about that, but I started thinking afterwards, I wonder if you could calculate SEO efficiency. All right. And pause. Uh, pause. We got to define this because people <laughs> are like, what, what do they mean? And so the concept he's talking about, about it, SEO efficiency is let's say that I got a website for a, a very uh, desirable keyword up to number five. And then my closest competitor, uh, they're still beating me. They're at number four. So we are side by side on page one. And so then I, I start looking at the data to see who got there because we're uh, effectively at the same spot, but who got there more efficiently? And so my competitor got to number four with 2,700 referring domains but I got right next to him at spot number five with 80. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you about the efficiency of their SEO? And so when we talk efficiency, we're like, who got there the easiest? Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a really cool thing because, uh, you know, I've come up with a method for sort of reverse engineering that out of uh, all that wonderful Quora data that you uh, put together for us. Um, and now we're beta testing it, you know, and I've got a, a group, um, actually a, a little beta group that's going to start next week. If people are interested, they can reach out to me uh, about that. But the few people that have handed out, you know, early prototypes of the, uh, the report, the process to have, uh, done some really, really amazing things quickly. I had, um, someone that the last week had a, um, uh, keyword in, in their city. Uh, it was a custom countertops, you know, sort of uh, uh, keyword, you know, in that sort of um, home services range. And they took the page, uh, they modified the page uh, based on the minimum recommendations. And they went from not in the top 100 to number 10 in 72 hours. So, you know, we're seeing lots and lots of really, really good movement. So now what I need is a number of beta testers to see 
if that's you know normal or if it's keyword dependent you know is a, is a more typical you're going from you know 40 to 30 or you know what that's that's what we're trying to figure out uh is you know how powerful uh the method is and it does a whole lot less stuff than normally you would do so we're trying to find ways of calculating where we can just pick up the dollar bills walking down the sidewalk as opposed to climbing a mountain so in a way, this is kind of a minimum viable SEO model. And uh, the, the warning on minimum viable SEOs, if Clint were here, uh, he, he would be shouting at us mm -hmm. that uh, minim minimum viable SEO tends to be weak SEO. So it's a good way to get beaten. <laughs> so you, it you is, kind but of... You know there's there's a blending of minimum viable in this but it's minimum viable given powerful factors so it's it, it's leveraging both so it's not minimal like least effort it's you know least effort combined with you know the power of whatever it is that you know the levers that we're trying to pull so that's the dynamic that you know we're interested in exploring in the beta is you know how quickly can you move how much do you move and does it hold but keep keep in mind that we are now so nuanced in our SEO craft that we can say this work will get you there, but then you need to consider this work to lock it in. Mm -hmm. So Lee's talking about the minimum to get you there, and Clint is complaining that's not going to lock it in. Yeah. And so just note that we're being very nuanced in the degree of tuning we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. And then I, always, I always have other things in the, uh, in the lab that I won't talk about publicly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got a lot of those running right now too. Cause uh, a lot of people have probably, probably heard me mention, but uh, 2024 is kind of a year of testing for me and it's, uh, the year of testing is, in fact, already begun. I've already started crafting some of the biggest SEO tests I've ever created. I'm already learning new concepts, uh, particularly in the field of e-commerce SEO. And so I'm learning new power plays uh, for, for e-com SEO. Um, and yeah, so a lot of, a lot of amazing things in the pipeline. What about you, Charles? What are you working on that you don't necessarily want to share, but we're putting you on the spot? No, no, I'll happily share. So I've been, uh, playing around a lot with, uh, podcasts. Uh, I know it's something that's kind of floated around for the past few months, uh, working with AI, text to speech, um, syndicating the podcast, using tools to do that. Um, it's pretty cool. <laughs> was was that uh, inspired by Holly Starks? I know in the past year she's been big on podcasting for SEO. Most definitely, yes. Um, I also have several tests in the hopper. I don't really want to talk about any of them yet because I'm not sure how they're going to work out. Um, if they work, I'll share them. If they work really well, really well, I won't share them. <laughs> and and Madge, you're doing podcasts now too. How's that working out? Um, yes, we've, uh, we have managed to automate the service. Um, again, not promoting the service, but it's only part of the goal for now. Um, so the, the press release that we write in house, we then convert into a podcast script, uh, use 11 labs to convert it to AI voice and then, uh, syndicate it across 15 platforms right now including your your top ones amazon google uh, apple and so forth so a little extra link love from the uh the podcast domains to the the root press release Correct. well and, and we're, we're embedding it as well and so. i'd imagine if your press release is on an actual popular topic it might be discovered 100 percent. so far we've seen uh many views B between i would say anything between 10 and 100 depending on uh, the topic itself, because some of our clients, they have e-com stores, they have, uh, there's a product from Germany. They do wooden products for Apple, uh, Apple and iPads and my, uh, laptops. That got a lot of views from podcasts. Uh, because what we're doing within the description of the podcast, we're adding some links in, you know, for the client as well as for our newsroom. So 
take it advantage of it. Very cool. Awesome. So it looks like we have uh, a couple questions uh, in the comments. We'll go ahead and get to those. Uh, be sure to ask any questions you might have, because otherwise I'll put the thread out there of a short show. We don't often have those, so uh, we'll take them if we can get them. But if you have questions, now's your chance. Um all right, I'm focusing on improving my website's ranking specifically on Bing. All right, so mm -hmm. that's uncommon in SEO. So, yeah. I mean, we we do it because we know the benefits of, of doing that effectively. Um, and so nor normally when we rank sites, we oftentimes will get to number one on Bing before we get to number one on Google. Um. Mm -hmm. Let's see, aiming to feature and browse with Bing option of uh, chat GPT. Yeah, I don't know much about that aspect of it. Have you played with that at all, uh, Lee? No, I mean, the, the thing I'll tell you about uh, Bing, it, it's a very different from Google, although fundamentally a lot of the, uh, the, the core things on Bing and Google are the same, uh, but Bing, if you go read their webmaster guidelines, they're actually honest about how the algorithm works and what you need to do to rank your site. Unlike Google, where the the web the search essentials uh, are largely incorrect or flat out wrong, and the Google pronouncements are subject to interpretation and you know all of those sort of things. Bing just says, "Here are the factors that we have, and here's what you need to do. And if you go follow those things, you'll rank well." That's you know, it's it's not hard. Uh, they gave you the roadmap, so I, yeah, I like and, that reason. And a lot of it works in Google too, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the the other features, like they're talking about, we have not uh, done any sort of you know playing with that. It's still new, so I have no clue. So I can give a little insight about Bing. Um, one of our smaller brands, about a month ago, almost two months ago now, we went through, we did a whole audit for them, and we had them fix things. Basic things, title tags, meta descriptions, canonical tags. Um, we saw a significant increase in our Bing, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo traffic to the point where now non-Google traffic is 16% of our organic traffic, which is phenomenal. For most of our brands, uh, Google is 93%, uh, something like that, and everything else is less than 1%. Um, yeah. And in online retail in the U.S., it can go even higher when you properly dial in all of your other syndicated search and uh, Bing. And that was, you know, 30 to 40 percent for our organic revenue uh, from search. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's a big number. And 40 think think about 40 percent when you're getting almost half of your organic revenue from not google I and mean, that's a little bump like if bing got 10 percent more market share it would be equally valuable at that point to google equally valuable mm -hmm. you would have to divvy half your time to the thing that's bringing in half your organic revenue <laughs> And yeah. so when you start talking 35, 40%, you're getting dangerously close to being equal value to what Google delivers. And uh, a lot of online retailers, man, they neglect Bing, but you shouldn't. I mean, that's well, a lot of money to leave on the table. You know, Charles brings up a, a good point that uh, also reminds me of something else. Bing is a stickler on you know technical stuff so a lot of times you, if you're not ranking well in bing it's because you've got little technical things wrong with your your site and you know the bing webmaster tools you know will show you you know some of those particular things so if you go fix like canonical tags or you know some of these things uh site-wide that may be uh, afflicting your site in bing then all of a sudden boom you get that additional stuff and i think in the us it's you know bing yahoo DuckDuckGo combined because they're all from the bing feed is about 16% of the traffic. So you can get your clients a 16% bump just by fixing your technical crap. Bing was the one who came out several years ago and they made a comment that they were looking for less than was a two or 3% uh, 
uh, error rate in your XMLs and things like that. So it's so that kind of re- reiterates your point, Lee, that that Bing is definitely making sure that it's it's getting an efficient crawl. I mean, I, I think that explains why they're so big on index now. They're trying to mm-hmm. you know make sure it's efficient as possible. Yeah. And uh, don't don't forget uh, in pay per click uh, the uh, price per click arbitrage between the two platforms. So oftentimes you'll have keywords that are two hundred dollars a click on Google, and you can get them for a dollar on Bing. And a click's a click, right? As long as it's a human being that typed in the search, that's targeting. And why wouldn't you get the dollar ones? You know, you yeah. want to buy those first, right? It's still and... cheap, but that, that gap is narrowing. Ever since they invested in OpenAI, you know, I was looking at some of those things the other day and I was like, holy moly, y'all have gone up. Now, that may be going up from, you know, a dollar to three or four or five dollars versus, you know, 50 or something along those lines. But you know, they've definitely made some uh, market moves with their pricing. Yeah, yeah. But if, if you monitor it, I mean, there are some keywords and some desirable spaces where you could probably go in and say, hey, I see you're running ads at a CPC of about X. I can sell you the, you know, the same search clicks for one tenth that price and probably make a good profit doing it. Mm hmm. Um, so yeah, keep in mind that, uh, there's more than just search, uh, in those opportunities. All right. So let's see, given your experience at Microsoft, I'm, (laughs) that's ancient experience that was in the late nineties. Um, I'm interested in your perspective on the use of black hat techniques by competitors, um, Bing, um, you know, I think I think nearly nearly all of negative SEO, uh, near nearly all of it is internal. It's self inflicted stuff, or it's you pissed off an employee or a, a consultant, and they sabotaged you on the way out the door. So the the vast majority of negative stuff in SEO causing you harm is very close to home and probably someone you know. Um the uh when when you get to the the larger scale like the the slow loris attacks that I faced in ecom those were a bit different. Those were people that live and die on the same keywords we're after. And they are desperate because they are all in on the inventory that they're selling. And if we sell instead of them because it's a limited market, then it's double damage because not only did they buy that inventory, then they couldn't move it. <laughs> And so, and in some keywords, it it gets really nasty very quickly. And so, you got to be careful about the spaces you're getting into because if there's that kind of desperation, then you start seeing the caliber of negative SEO attack that most people will never experience in their careers. And so most people have never been hit with the slow loris negative SEO attack. It can cost your business hundreds of thousands of dollars in a very short amount of time. Uh, when I saw it, it was this time of year that you would see it. It would be these feeble denial of service attacks that we could thwart. And we were like, yeah, we stopped them. We shut them down within 15 minutes. We're awesome damage was already done we just didn't understand how the attack worked and so they managed to get 500 errors sent from our server to googlebot googlebot de-indexed our site temporarily when it came back it came back seven or eight positions lower for two weeks and that was a black friday bundle (laughs) And so you do that in a time of year when you do 80% of your online revenue, and that murders your revenue. It murders it. And so most SEOs, they're like, oh, I never see it. Well, if you have a garbage blog, nobody cares to attack it. It's not a target. 
no there's no reason to attack it nobody's even competing with it it's very likely nobody's even read it so yeah you haven't even seen any <clears throat> negative seo on that but if you have something important that's making money that's competing with other people trying to make money and it's a volatile pressure cooker because the shipping cutoff at this time of year is final and limited market, then the gloves come off. And so just note, if you haven't seen negative SEO, you're probably not an interesting target. Uh, but that's that's okay. It's good to not be a target of negative SEO. But, you know, things, different problems come with different levels of success. And so at that higher end, uh, you know, millions of dollars of revenue in e -com, then you start looking at these types of scales of attack that can be devastating at the scale of business you operate at. Uh, Charles, what have you seen in terms of negative SEO? Because you're enterprise. Yeah, we see all kinds of stuff. Um, I think one thing that's worth pointing out when it comes to negative SEO uh, Google says it's not possible. They're lying. They know not only that it's possible, but they they cannot stop it. Uh, I think we talked about this in one of the past episodes. We found a spam attack on one of our sites, actually all of our sites. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to a Google rep, a Google representative. I showed him, this is what's happening. How do we stop this? Um, their answer was really not non-answer. They told us, oh, no index the page. They didn't even tell me no index the page. He sent me a link to a page of Google that says no index your page. Um, and then the site that was doing it to us, they took that site down, but I gave them lots of examples. They didn't take down the network um, and I never really heard back from people. So I think I think that's a great example of how Google knows it's out there. They can't stop it. And I'm not sure they want to try to stop it. I don't, or they just decided it's not worth them trying to stop these kinds of things. And that was a very, and, and Ted, you know exactly what I'm talking about and I'll probably be presenting on this um, soon, but. Um, it was a very innocuous attack from in terms of negative SEO or innocuous in the sense that it wasn't taking down our site or really causing any huge, huge issues, although it was causing performance issues, I'm sure. Um, and, and it's it's known and it's, it's still active. Um, I'm testing it right now to see exactly how effective it is. Yeah, yeah. If you have slides, we'd love to have that as a show anytime. Um. All right, so let's let's move on to another question. Um all right, so the e-commerce website has some filter URLs stuck in the Google index. I blocked them in robots.txt. Is there a way to get rid of these from the Google index? It's very hard once you make this mistake. Um so the the best solution in my opinion is a web development solution and you code it so that your sorts and filters and faceted navigation simply do not draw to the page when it's a google bot because uh, when you do that then there's no decision that google can make incorrectly <laughs> so you you take the option of google deciding away and that is the only foolproof way to get Google to do the right thing because there are tons of examples of Google uh, not abiding by robots.txt and not abiding by the nofollow uh, directives. Those, those are honor system things, and Google promises a best effort but no guarantee. If so I can if jump you... in. Oh, sorry. Sure. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to, if I can jump in, one thing I've learned in enterprise is a shockingly large percentage of my time is spent getting things out of Google. Um, most SEOs never spend any time trying to get it. I literally spend like 20% of my time trying to get pages out of Google. Um, if you have a page, let's say one of these filter pages that are in Google, uh, robots.txt is not the way to do it. Uh, if you go to the doc, Google's documentation about robots.txt, they even have, and I think we talked about this on a past one, but I can, I can share it in the future. They even have a little red box that says, if you want something out of Google's index, don't use robust.txt. Uh, robust.txt, I'm not sure what I would use it for anymore. Uh, I would use the noindex nofollow meta robots. 
Um, you have to make sure that that page is not in robust.txt because if you use both, now Google can't crawl your content to see the no index, no follow meta tag. Um, well, put that in there. Be careful with that because they're talking about in the case of a faceted navigation, they still want their uh, their amethyst jewelry category in search. They just don't want it in search with sorted descending. So, so you're absolutely right. So that, that and that was one of the warnings I was going to get. So if you if you know index a page, it Google Google crawls the page, but they don't display it. That's what a no index does. Um, you can get it out of Google's index by doing a temper. If you have the no index set, do a temporary removal. However, huge warning. It will remove it. And I ran a test on the page that did not have a no index on it. It removed that page from the index. Um, so Google doesn't check. It, Google used to check and see, does this page, uh, is this page available to us? And if it was, it would give you a warning. It doesn't do that anymore. It just takes it out. Uh, and I'm waiting to see how long it takes for it to come back. Uh, to your point, though, <laughs> if we're talking about a page with a parameter on it, um, yeah, I'll discuss it. So back when, so a few several years ago, we were going to do a migration and put a and uh, Adobe told us to put a parameter on it and just throw and redirect through the parameter. I said that is a disastrous idea. Um, one of the devs on my team had a great idea. They put the parameter on using JavaScript, and Google never saw that parameter. So if you have a parameter, if you have a system where you have to do parameterized URLs. JavaScript's your answer, and I think I'll just leave it at that. And I'll let Ted give you all the all the proper uh, coding warnings <laughs> because I am not a coder, <laughs> so don't take any coding advice from me, guys. Yeah, uh, Im implementation is going to matter a lot on that, and so I recommend if you do anything like that that you make a small test site and test your engineering's behavior before you do it to the money site because. Uh, you can uh, tank a website for 10 months if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so look, I'm sorry, Ted, I just want to say that's a really, really good, that's like a huge knowledge bomb. If we had that soundboard and do like the little explosion like Dre does, <laughs> that's right there because before you do something on your site that's making you money, test it someplace. Don't just launch things on production sites thinking, oh, I know what's going to happen because it never works out properly. Uh, again, going back to this example um, with the with the uh, parameters, I set up a test site. I ran literally like 12 or 15 different variations, everything I could possibly think about how could Google treat it. Now, it worked out perfectly for us and, it were, and you know the developer's idea was right, but I ran so many tests on that before we even considered pushing that out to a, pro a production site. No, don't get, you know, was the, we don't want to be guest SEOs. We want to be SEOs. Just if you don't know how Google's going to react, just test it and then you'll know. Yep. Sorry, Ted, I just had to go on a quick rant. No, no, exactly. And and that, that exact advice is kind of my origin story in SEO. I was a web developer. They had 15 stores. I said, give me the tiny one that you're planning to close down so I can experiment on it. And uh, then uh, I failed a lot. I did a lot of damage to that little site, <laughs> but I, I found a lot of victories too. And the company only ever knew about the victories because when I found the victories, I'd say, do this to the other 14 stores. And they'd be like, oh, my God, you have the Midas touch. It's double digit growth every time you recommend something. And they never saw my failures. It's just, oh, uh, that that horrible thing I did. Let's just sweep that under the rug. No need to even discuss it. But, oh, yeah, I got another idea for the other 14 stars. <laughs> You know, and so, yeah, you need a safe place to fail. Uh, as SEOs, we often get ourselves backed into a corner where our next mistake gets us fired or loses the client. And you you know that stress. Everybody in SEO has felt it at one point in time or another. And, and so when you're in that backed up corner, you're actually in a very problematic spot because you're not going to do bold things. You're not going to experiment with new ideas. Those mm -hmm. things are too risky. 
all you're gonna do is safe as possible choices no no risk no risk no risk and you you don't learn and your results tend to be very flat and you ultimately get fired anyway (laughs) Mm -hmm. because once you're in that mode i mean it's just a clock that's ticking down that's all that is And so you need, you absolutely need to have a safe place to fail because that's how you learn your craft. That's how you learn new things. That's how you figure out good advice. And so if you don't have a safe place to fail, you are missing the number one SEO tool. Because right there, that's it. Safe place to fail is the number one tool in SEO. What do you think, Lee? Uh, I'll go small because I don't have the enterprise experience of either of you two gentlemen. But there was a, a test that um, Honey had done a lot of research on WordPress themes and things like that. She had a, a test site of hers that was you know ranked number one for a number of different terms, and she decided to test just changing the theme. And when she changed the theme, it dropped. You know, it had a significant drop in rankings, and it took four months to recover. Just, you know, with because when you change a WordPress theme, you're changing every page of your site. You're changing the HTML on all those pages. And some WordPress themes have some SEO baked in that, you know, and some don't. And, you know, so you're making, you know, just an architecture change that that potentially is a four month recovery from just going, oh, I like the way this theme looks better. So when I hear of, you know, SEOs uh, wanting to make an enterprise level just code change and just launch it i'm like holy hell you are risking so much on a you know a stupid thing that you could just test on a nothing site first just to figure out you know that it's not going to wreck your career or the company potentially because you make a code change going into black friday you know yeah you you can get some two dollar domains right now there's no reason to not test Like I I was telling that to uh, uh, a client in uh, e-com recently, his employer wasn't letting him do the SEO he needs to do on the page. So we're sitting there looking at the data and the data is everything their competitors are willing to do, but they're not. And guess who's outranking who? Yeah. And so we're looking at these empirical measurements of your competitors are willing to do this. What's your reluctance? And uh, uh, so just trying to get to the bottom of that. And, you know, it always comes down to these uh, uh, these editorial standards. Well, we're far more noble than the competition who outranks us. <laughs> the vast amounts of competition that outranks us. So, all right, so you have your nobility, but uh, nobility isn't going to pay your bills. Um, So what what can an SEO do when he can't twist the arm of the larger business? Well, you, you buy a $2 domain and you put those principles into action, you give yourself a site-wide footer link from the main property, and when that page is outranking, the original on the store, you go back to them and say, well, we could have this if you guys could adjust your thinking. (laughs) But if you can't adjust your thinking, I guess we'll have what you have now, which is, you know, bottom of page two or top of page three. But we, you know, we could be, you know, number five if you guys would just compete. And so now, now, you know, your challenge there is to say, I want you to justify why we shouldn't compete. Because I, I thought we were in the business of, of selling X. So you're saying no to selling X. So you justify that. Um, that's, a, that's a present. That's a, that's a session for us to discuss all in of itself is how do you, is how do you convince how do you convince folks to make the changes that they're afraid to make? I've run into that so many times. Mm-hmm. And often it's as simple as people are afraid to make a change because yeah. change has risk. There's no risk in not doing anything. I mean, there's we all understand if you really think about that, the risk is you don't do well, but it's an invisible risk. 
the, the risk of making a change and having it go bad, that's a tangible risk. Um, yeah, and it gets weird. Like I've seen in online stores where the, the custom built lazy load functionality is hiding the content from Google. <laughs> so literally the lazy load has cloaked the content from Google so Google doesn't see it. And they're like, why does the SEO suck? And then it's like, oh, it's this lazy load capability that you've built. And then they're like, oh, well, we can't change that. It's it's performance of the server. Well, what about performance of the business? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's like they won't touch it. Well, we can't upset the engineer. He worked on that for months. That's mission critical. He He told us he's our engineer. <laughs> Who's running this business? <laughs> You know, and, and you you encounter that all the time. And so, you know, are you in the business of selling products or are you in the business of building custom lazy load integration? And how how are your lazy load integration sales going? Yeah, you know, it's great topic, man. Great that's, that's a that's a whole topic. I'll have to put together some slides to share at some point in the future. How do you get folks? Like, what methods have I used in enterprise, especially to get it, folks to take action? Because it is hard sometimes. It is real hard. Yeah, you you go to Signals Lab and and people dunk on enterprise SEOs left and right. Oh, you're just spending a big brand authority. But what you don't know is that if you need to convince someone to do something, the enterprise SEO is your best friend. Because what do they do all day, every day, year yeah. after year? They convince business units and Fortune 5000 companies to do the right thing, yeah. to do the SEO work in their departments. And so that type of uh, leverage that type of knowledge, it's different than ranking a plumber. And it's useful, though, when your plumber won't do what you need them to do. So there is something you can learn from enterprise SEO, and that is how do you build consensus? And so, yeah, I, I love that topic. That's a huge topic. Um, What do you think, Lee, on building consensus? Ever have issues with it? You know... <clears throat> Uh, going outside of SEO back to my consulting days. Yeah. I mean, because you have, you know, business owners, uh, there's two primary ones that you face. One is that the thing that's not working was the business owner's idea. So you're basically going in there and telling them their baby's ugly and it needs to die. Um, and, and, and no business owner wants to hear that. The, the other one is there is that fear. I mean, I, I was laughing. So I was thinking as Charles was talking, you know, I'm number 31. Yes, so you need to make a change. But, you know, then if we're not number 31, we could drop out of the index. And I'm like, what business impact would that be if you went from number 31 to nowhere? Because at number 31, you are nowhere. You know, people don't want to lose the thing, even if it's not producing for them, they don't want to lose it. And most of what I see in dealing with with SEOs is there's a fear of, you know, the the Google hammer, you know, in some form or fashion. If I do the thing, whatever it is, isn't that a little and won't Google come and do the thing? And then, you know, and then we're all dead permanently. You know, that that fear is uh, one that's pervasive in preventing people from taking actions. You know, I still have people that say, yeah, I don't want to put my keyword on the page anymore because I don't want to risk a thing. And I'm like, your competitors have it hundreds of times more than you do. You know, that's why you're you're stuck where you are. And and yet, you know, the logic is somehow overridden by the emotional uh, fear or, you know, that comes along with it. So I think the sort of that psychology would be a great Fight Club episode. Yep. Yep. They that's one area of enterprise SEO I, I think is just a powerhouse. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that topic. I think there's a lot to share there and a lot to share that people haven't heard before. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Someone says, uh, did a magic PR for one of my clients in 2019 to test his service. A uh, client got a radio spot uh, based on being found on some of the news sites 
Uh, it was counseling and therapy was the topic space, which got her more links. So yeah, it, you know, it's a bit dated, but it's always good to hear an experience. So, you know, there's one from his early days. Imagine what uh, Madge's service is doing today. Uh, so I, I'd say it's worth exploring. Uh, and when you look at link building costs, the press release is often uh, the best cost per link. So if you break it down by that dimension, uh, it's a no brainer. Um, let's see, assuming you do a 301 correctly, uh, relevant, uh, directed to a page, uh, making it look like a company was acquired. How many 301s can you do? I, I, I don't think there's a limit on 301s. Uh, the main, the main issue I worry about with the 301s, well, there's two, uh, uh, one is is how do you redirect? Uh, most people are redirecting to the home page. I think that has a high failure rate uh, because redirects to home can be uh, can trigger Google's soft 404 treatment. And so I think there's a, a high possibility when you point it at a home page that uh, you get no credit for it as a soft 404. Um, and then uh, the other uh, the other issue with it is I've known people who have bought up defunct businesses uh, only to later get legal action brought against them because when businesses go under, the domain is one of the assets that gets liquidated uh, for the shareholders and the uh, debtors. And so you... You know, if you're out there buying up defunct businesses, it's probably a matter of time before you get caught up in, in one of these things where that property isn't yours. And, uh, you know, it's changing hands. There are trademarks involved, so you couldn't use it even if you wanted to. And those are changing ownership. And that's all happening on paper. You can't look that up in Google. And so you got to be careful uh when you play that game um so you know there's some risk it, it's low risk but i've seen people get burned what do you think I, I would add the uh, the other one that uh, you've seen from time to time is you could buy a, a domain that's toxic and then you point it at you know your your site and tank it because it's got a a negative history so you just negative seo'd yourself because a lot of people don't Test the 301 test redirect somewhere else, you know. Test and, it yeah. first. Test it first. Yes, exactly. What we're just saying. <laughs> and and then when you find the toxic ones, uh, you give them to Carolyn Holzman, who does testing on them. Mm -hmm. So that's an area of study. So if you find scorched earth in Google, be sure to uh, give it to Carolyn. And you can find her on the crawl or no crawl or confessions of an seo podcast um let's see i'm getting a chorus subscription in the next few days is there a black friday deal there's never a black friday deal and the reason there is never a black friday deal is i never ever ever undercut my affiliates pricing that'll never happen so uh, my affiliates, they get a 25% discount. That's like a Black Friday deal, right? But it's available all year round, and only my affiliates can give you that discount. And I never give anyone a reason to undercut my affiliates, and I never let my affiliates undercut each other. So I just never do it. So you'll just have to deal with the fact that the Black Friday special is all year round. You just have to find a Cora affiliate and reach out to me if you're having trouble finding one. I can uh, hook you up. Um, what is your opinion on using hidden div tags to keyword stuff on a specific on specific web pages? Uh, this used to be a best practice, and now I think it's unnecessary. And so the best practice of it was that uh, it was very good to see the outcome 
of the ranking change before you invest in the custom content tuned to that standard. So it's much better to see what you were going to get out of it before you made that expensive content. And so in that way, we would put the SEO in a hidden div, let Google process it, see what the tuning standard did. Then we go back and true up the hidden div to content tuned to that degree. And then it's white hat. And so for a couple days, we do a black gray hat type of thing to, to kind of see, is this worth doing? Once we got that outcome, then we do the hard work of making the content. And so for a year, maybe two years, that was kind of the best practice. Uh, but now ChatGPT is out. And you can create uh, supplemental content that's human readable and on topic and supplemental content is white hat. You can go to the quality raters guidelines, read all about it. It's to be uh, favorably scored when it's on topic and relevant to the keyword. And that's super easy. AI is awesome for supplemental content. It's its number one strength. And so now that does the exact same thing but it doesn't have to hide because it's white hat and you don't have to go back to true it up. So it does the exact same thing, but it eliminates an expensive step. So it's unnecessary. What do you think, Lee? You know, I'll agree with you. The thing that I think uh, that I hear a lot in that is, does it still work? Yes, it absolutely still works. You know, I still use that, that technique uh, today. Um, you know, to test stuff out and everything else. So it still works. It's still valid. It's still usable, uh, you know, but I think, you know, to Ted's point, you know, once you have it, if you're going to end up rolling it into content, then you have to reprocess it again. And Ted prefers just to do the uh, supplemental content once, throw it on the page, get the rankings boost and, <clears throat> you know, call it a day. And it's white hat. <laughs> Doesn't even have to hide. Can't be <coughs> narked on. So the, a lot of a lot of value there um all right um ted uh would all your pooled cora data highlight themes that tend to rank higher and bang you know i have a database uh dedicated to bing factors but i lost my integration with bing and so there's a gap in the data so i can't really speak scientifically on it at the moment i am looking to fix that as soon as possible uh bing did a thousand x on their rate sheet and all of the qualified api integrations closed up shop and so now what we have are the black hat ones that often result in cease and desist and they get shut down themselves and uh, they're not stable and they're not engineered correctly to do proper SEO. And so I, I can't just cookie cutter any API. I need to find a Bing API provider that's willing to work with me a little bit so we can get them into shape to do professional SEO. And so I haven't found one of those yet. So if you're a Bing API provider and you're willing to make some small changes to make your product better, let me know. I am interested in talking to you. Um, but yeah, there uh, we do have a capability to look at the top factors of Bing. We do have a capability to look at the top factors in mobile uh, and local. And uh, so all of those things are doable. All of them are largely coded, but not all of them are presented or up to date. Um, let's see, uh, Lee, uh, you have any thoughts on, uh, Bing factors, top factors right now? You know, not, not specific factors because I mean, Bing cake has, you know, three large buckets that they go into. One is the sort of the relevance of your content. And that means using your keyword and its variants on the page. You know, that's a very Google thing as well. Uh, Bing is a little bit more literal. Uh, than Google is with respect to that. So get your, you know, the keyword you're trying to rank the page for, get it on the damn page. Um, links, anchor text, you know, that Bing was very responsive to anchor text coming into a page and traffic, you know, if I, you can, go ahead. Oh, I, I don't want to out something you might not want to share, but is, does Bing have a cost of entry? 
Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, uh, and they'll, they'll talk about it. If Bing trusts sites that have links from other sites that are indexed in Bing. So if you, and they, they say that in their, the webmaster guidelines. Um, so, you know, if something has, if you're trying to link from a bunch of properties that are, uh, that don't have any indexation in Bing, you're probably not going to get credit for it, but you know, you can go and, um, I like building, you know, an Azure cloud link because Bing loves itself, you know, at least it's aware of itself. So if you do that, you know, you can, you can, uh, check that tick box to get you in. But basically Bing comes down to, you know, keywords on page, keywords in anchor text. And if you can bump it with a little bit of traffic because Bing relies heavily on user metrics, none of that stuff is, is new or surprising. And it's very, very straightforward to implement to, to rank stuff in Bing. Yeah, and most people new to Bing uh, fail to go into the Bing Webmaster tools and adjust the crawl rate. The default crawl rate in Bing uh, amounts to about crawling one page per week. So you need to up that crawl rate if you want to have fast uh, updates. So don't forget that part. Um, last week, Ted mentioned Google is likely investing more into new gen search rather than heavily investing fixing their current systems i don't have any proof of that i just get that feeling because they never fix anything so why would they ne never fix anything uh they and so they're just saying to me they're saying it's not worth the time and effort and so why would it not be worth the time and effort because they're hoping to replace it more just so, 90 plus percent global market share. <laughs> yeah. <says it's> <laughs> yeah. When, when you have a junker of a car that's starting to fail and there's a big tear in one of the bucket seats, do you invest in fixing the bucket seat or do you just duct tape it? Yeah, that's the thing. It's they're duct taping. It. Um, let's see. Um, do you think a uh, new uh, generative search will uh, weigh in user metrics more? Uh, not not in the current implementation because the search executives are morons. And so I, I, I say that with love because I want them to do the right thing, but they seem to think that what the public wants is safety protocols. You know, come come use our search because we'll keep you safe and we'll deny you all the capabilities that will help you do useful work. That's what they're selling right now. And that makes them more. Uh, what, what we want is generative AI that is search engine aware. We Until we can write a prompt that says, uh, get the top 100 results for the keyword SEO software and uh, create HTML that has a thumbnail of each and a brief description of each. Until you can write that prompt and it's snappy and works, it's, it's a football bat. It's not even a useful tool. And so if they're going to be, you know, if they're selling safety, then they're never going to let you do that. And so that's what they're denying you right now. And they're like, why doesn't it work? Why isn't it popular? Well, Google wants to maintain the status quo. That's how they get the most out of what they their current position. So Google doesn't want change because they're winning. Change means they might not be winning. All right. So this is really a complaint uh, to Microsoft because Microsoft, they... For some dumb reason, their playbook is copy all of Google's moves. And it's stupid. You, you don't win copying the other team's play exactly. Like, nobody does that except morons. So you got to be bold. You got to do new things. You got to give people solutions they want. And those search executives... They're selling you safety protocols and nobody wants it. And that's why when you safety. go and use it, what's that? They want the safety. So I agree with you hundred percent, Ted, but using my, my enterprise hat in a large organization, the safe choice is always the choice you pick because yeah, but 
That's Maybe not how you dominate risky. markets. Agreed. 100% agreed. But but the, the Microsoft strategy of we'll always be number two is safe. If they do something different, they may be worse. And well, nobody wants to have their name attached to the project that failed. Um, mm-hmm. so well, I'm not saying it's the right decision. I'm just saying that's, that's <clears throat> the logic behind it. Well, the the graphical web browser, the World Wide Web, was not a safe choice, but it was worth doing. <laughs> and that's so really- AI... It's not a safe choice, not at all. but it's probably worth doing, especially if you want to be successful in AI. Agreed. And so playing it safe, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's not how you get to the moon. <laughs> all right. Big things have risks. You know, we need grownups in the room that can handle that. And mm-hmm. we don't currently have that on the search executive teams. Yeah, I'm going to go with this question a little bit differently. I'm going to object to the premise. Um, We have, you know, AI is still in its infancy. In spite of all the cool stuff we've seen over the last 12 months, it's still in its infancy. And so the development of AI, the technologies, marketplace adoption, you know, what the users expect. I'm not sure that SGE is the, the place where we'll end up. I know that, you know, Google's certainly pushing it. Microsoft is certainly copying it. But I don't see people, you know, uh, killing it. I see more people, uh, strangely enough, that are like Ted to say, you know, I don't go to Google anymore. I just, you know, I ask ChatGPT and see what it says. Or, you know, the younger generation, I just go search on, you know, TikTok, you know, those kind of things. So I don't see where this is sort of the explosive avenue for search engines to pull in more users yet i'm not impressed with the the capabilities that are there they can't while they're selling you know safety protocols nobody wants it i mean you'll never see what it can do until you turn the engine on right so but i also know i was going to say i also know at this particular time you know because of we're in the infancy of of a new technology if there's two people in a garage somewhere that got something invented that we don't know about yet. And so those things are going to continue to come out in AI, you know, in the coming months and years and, you know, potentially have the, the capability of changing the landscape of what we're looking at. So the presumption that, you know, SGE is the thing and the next evolution is, is this thing. I'm not sure that it's there because there's not, SGE is not a great thing right now. No, you know, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's still in development. It, yeah. yeah, it's a football bat because they deny you productivity. And that's why everybody still goes to uh, ChatGPT or, or similar setups to ChatGPT to do real work. Nobody's going to, to Google's SGE to do real work. There's, there's no point. The safety protocols get in the way. It's clunky. No. Mm-hmm. The, the answer is no, and the search executives need to hear it. The answer is no, this is stupid. So give us a productivity tool that helps us do more with our time or go away. <laughs> you know, that's it. You know, that's the proposition, Google and 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 Microsoft. You know, we we don't we don't care who has the longer list of safety protocols. We just simply do not give a crap. Put on a disclaimer and let us do useful work. You also saw the, uh, I don't know if you did uh, a couple of days ago, that with the open AI stuff that happened, uh, Meta disbanded their um, AI, their safety team, basically. <clears throat> they just disbanded that group and reassigned everybody to you know the generative AI thing. So... You know, apparently, at least Meta, the gloves are coming off. <laughs> yeah, Paul is uh, asking, uh, would you consider getting a team together to build an AI without annoying safety protocols? I'm not enough of an AI expert to be a, a you know, a real contributing part of a team like that. But I'm happy to give you my advice on what I find useful. And, 
you know, if you build the product to help people do efficient work and to do powerful things, it's going to be wildly popular. If you build a football bat with tons of limitations in it that keeps telling you no every time you try to do something, well, that's not going to be so popular. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, yeah, somebody, I, I like the way you're thinking because somebody out there is going to have nothing to lose and is going to get tired of the bullshit and do it. And, you know, probably whoever does that well first is going to decimate the other players. Cause that's, that's what chat GPT showed like, Hey, this is useful and productive. And it grew like no other internet property in the history of internet properties. That's what productivity can do. Now, safety protocols, that slowed the growth, right? <laughs> How's that growth curve now? Mm -hmm. That's what safety protocols can do. So, uh, yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe somebody there will get brave, you know? <clears throat> um, let's see. Um... Why not use the uh, indexing API to remove URLs from the Google SERP? Well, I, I thought that was for getting things into it. I guess if you if you put in the meta tags to no index and you know yeah, it, the, it, the, it's the better. The API Ted has has the the setup of it basically has a URL and a an index, but it, you can also run it URL and D index. It's, it's, that's a, uh, possible oh, so use of the API. So there, yeah, there's a mode for it. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe if it requires a test, if it works, then great. If it doesn't work, then you're going to need a different method. And so, um, hopefully it works. That would be a great cheap way to do it, but then, you'll have to deal with the actual problem in the web development to probably get it fixed. Um, and so honestly, the, when, when I was in online retail, the, the best solution we ever had to avoiding the problem in the first place is anything Google shouldn't be getting into just simply should not be drawn on the page when it's Google bot. So Googlebot visits, we're not even drawing the faceted navigation. Googlebot visits, we're not even adding an add to cart button. Googlebot doesn't need those parts. And they can't decide to do anything if it's not there. So you take away their decision, and then you get reliable behaviors. <laughs> And so if you trust Google to do the right thing, you often end up feeling like a fool. Um, all right. Uh, category and tag pages to index or no index. I believe the uh, channeling the spirit of Clint Butler depends what you do with them. If they're thin nothing pages, they're going to harm you. But if you actually put unique, useful content on it, uh, they can be a powerful device. So it depends what you're doing with them. If you're doing the wrong things with them, it's going to hurt you. He just discussed that yesterday on his SEO this week. Um, uh, he actually is, is, if anyone hasn't watched Clint's SEO this week from yesterday, definitely watch it. He does discuss specifically what to do with tag pages when he uses them, when he doesn't use them, but he had a lot of really good linking tips on this. A lot of knowledge bombs on that one. Yeah, yeah. And we love Clint. Uh, so check out his show, SEO, this week. It's very tactical. It's hands-on. Uh, he shows you how to do stuff. So it sounds like he has an even better answer to this question. So check out that episode. Um. All right. Let's see. I use a site I don't care about to test things and uh, to implement the posting learnings on, on the main site. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if you're if you're testing things on a small site and taking the wins and moving them to a big site, 
that that's a great idea and it's an awesome idea if you're trying to climb a corporate ladder like if you're an in-house seo and you're trying to navigate yourself to the executive team that that's a fast track if you do it right <laughs> um all right so uh, i'm getting uh golden seo knowledge here great that's our goal is to try to help people um, I'm working in off-page SEO for my client. Uh, off-page is worth now and in 2024. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Links matter. They're not, when Google says backlinks aren't the number one factor, they're being honest. It's a rare moment of uh, clarity coming out of Google. Backlinks are not the top factor. And we know this. We have data on this. They are absolutely not the strongest SEO factor. Uh, but they're still really powerful. You know, when you look at the 100,000 possible factors, their backlinks are in the top 100. So they're near the top, but they aren't the strongest. Um. Let's see. Uh, I'm considering setting up an RSS news feed on an age domain that links to all of my PBNs that are in the same niche. I'm thinking it'll get my PBNs to index fast, uh, plus a link to every post. Do you think it's worth testing? Um, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know. If RSS feed links make it into the link graph, and I, I wonder about what happens when an RSS feed includes external links to pages that aren't from its own website. And so I haven't really tested that. It's an interesting edge case because that would be a remarkable way to stealth some backlinks if that worked. Because then you'd want to set up all your PBNs with custom RSS feeds that do the interlinking in the feed and not on the web pages, and you've effectively killed NARC SEO for your link wheeling. Um, that's remarkable edge case. I haven't tested it. I, I don't know. Lee, what do you think? You know, I know there's uh, uh, some techniques from years back that were very, very popular using, you know, RSS mashups where you'd put multiple RSS feeds together and put them into Google and, you know, they would do a variety of things. I would imagine that that setup would at least make Google aware of your links. But I, I look at this question, a lot of times people don't make the distinction between just getting your links crawled and getting them indexed they actually want them indexed and you know so I, I wonder like if you have a pbn why do you want those links indexed versus just crawled in in the link graph where they're they're doing the work so there, there's a couple of levels to this question but uh you know i can imagine that rss uh feeds you know fed to google would at least you know feed them your uh your links and because their mashups have been capable they, they don't have to be an rss feed just strictly from your site strictly having your links so ideas like you know if you did a gsa blast if you put it all into an rss feed would google effectively crawl it those are good questions but i don't have the answers to them any thought charles yeah i can't answer specifically what will happen i do know um that google likes rss feeds um it does ingest the content of rss feeds how does it treat it i couldn't tell you but i do know they like rss feeds yeah, so to answer your final question, I do think it is worth testing. That's an interesting place to test, in my opinion. And uh, thank you so much for the super chat. We'll use it on uh, promoting the channel. So thank you for that. Um, all right, let's see. I got a backlink from Fox. Uh, the story was copy-pasted with the link uh, to the Sinclair Group network of 100 websites. If the page content is identical, does it still count as different backlinks? Yes. All press releases are duplicate content. People get upset saying that, oh, they don't appear in search. 
Well, the reason they don't is they get filtered as duplicates. All right, but that doesn't mean they're all not in the link graph. Link graph is separate from what's appearing in search. They're two different systems. So all of those links can be in the uh, link graph, but not appear in search results. And you just have to know that and be okay with it. That's a whole another issue for a Fight Club session, the understanding of what is duplicate content and there is no do it. Google said it themselves, there's no do content penalty, but there is a filter and understanding the difference is super important. And Nathan, I'm going to find those links. I'm going to log into the CMS and find those links in here. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm just teasing. <laughs> All right. Uh, static HTML deployed to Firebase and uh, can test lots easily. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Let, it, let us know what you discover. That sounds really interesting. Um, do you do parasite and how do you update the links on the parasites when the affiliate changes the offer landing page product, when you don't have access to the page, your affiliate link is on, uh, you know, I, I kind of prefer to control all the variables, so I don't do a lot of, uh, seo of things that are outside of my control um that's you know it's kind of like uh uh i guess uh using graffiti for marketing purposes <laughs> so you're going up to somebody else's building and you're saying you know shop at joe's <laughs> on their wall mm -hmm. um you know can it can it work? I suppose, but you know what what kind of shoppers are gonna respond to it, and uh, you know is is there a better way? Is there a way to make a better hourly rate doing work than you know putting a ton of time and energy into something that probably won't get you your best hourly rate of revenue? But to be honest, I I don't know what you're doing. You you know, if you're selling drugs online, your hourly rate probably beats mine. Uh, so who who knows what you're doing and what your situation is? Uh, but, you know, I, I wonder, you know, can is there an easier way? It sounds like that's, you know, probably a hard road to go. It might work, but it sounds harder than what I would do. And And I'm pretty good at getting to number one for various keywords. And so oftentimes I put in a day's worth of effort and end up waiting three weeks and then I get to top of page one. You know, that's kind of my work cycle. Um, and so I wonder how much time you're putting in and what type of result you're getting out of it and is the juice worth the squeeze? And so I would want you to think about it from business terms before you think about it from technical seo terms and is this the best use of your time to make good money and so that's that's what i'd want you to think about first what do you think lee i agree with you i think i'll just go with a little uh, practical tip if you're going from you know all these uh, parasite sites and you know just direct linking you know to the uh, the affiliate product instead of do that put a site that you own in the middle you know Ted's crazy links X, Y, Z. And so you can always go back onto Ted's crazy links and change the target a whole lot easier than you can logging in across your network of parasite sites. Yeah, that's a great tip there. Uh, Charles, I know it's outside your wheelhouse, but do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, no, not particularly. You know, I haven't really done much in the way of parasite SEO. The only thing I would say the kind of along the way of what Lee did is years ago, I put links into a YouTube video and I wanted to test, this is a personal thing I did, and I wanted to test multiple offers. So I used a redirect link so that I could change up the offer without having to go in and, and, and change the link in the video or change the video or anything. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can get awesome. creative rather than, you know, using that site in the middle to link, you could also use a link rotator in the middle to link to four or five different offers and, you know, just see, you know, if the traffic was worth it, you know, if you have enough traffic to be able to test that, that's a good way of doing things too. I know uh, there are a number of people that have talked about that technique as well. 
right, and let me switch to live chat. I may have missed a few questions. Um, we have a local question that's probably best suited for Charles. Uh, why are news sites suddenly facing significant indexing delays? Are you seeing that yourself, and why might that be? I'm not facing any in, any indexing de delays. Um, now, of course, everybody watching is screaming, of course, because you have these huge enterprise domains, and Google loves enterprise. Um, I'm not convinced that there's a different algorithm for my sites than for everybody else's sites. As a matter of fact, I don't think there is at all. Um, the question I would have is, how are you getting, how is Google finding you? If it's just you're relying on Google to come to your page and crawl you, and that's how Google finds you, yeah, that could change. That could change regularly as, as the algo changes. Um, are you, how are you feeding your site and all of your new articles into Google? And that's really the key when it comes to news is are you feeding, what is the process you have to feed the, the content into Google? And are you making, as, making it as cheap and easy for Google to discover and render, crawl and render your content as possible? If you're not, then yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see deviations. If you are, then it should always be pretty consistent. And, and I'll channel uh, Clint Butler again, who uh, came up with the amazing advice that if you're having trouble getting indexed, you need to try multiple methodologies at the same time. Cool. All right. Uh, we're 30 minutes over, so we'll we'll cut it there. Thank you, everyone. And if we missed your question, I'm uh, very sorry about that. We'll catch it next time. And thanks again, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.